Hello, all the gathering room peoples. I am not live today, and the gracious badger is behind the camera today. Hello. Yes, the gracious badger speaketh, because we are in Londolozi, South Africa, for our annual Self-Transformation Adventure Retreats, acronym STAR. You are welcome. So yeah, we're in Africa. It's in, it's going to be dark at night at our usual time. And also the internet is not always the most reliable, but we did want to touch in and say hello because you can't not do the gathering room two weeks in a row. My inner voice did say to me. So, um, I have a little topic I made, but I won't be able to take your questions, but I hope that you're all having a wonderful time wherever you are. What I want to talk about is basically the reason I'm here, which is that shaking up your life and doing things differently is one of the most profound things you can do to have psychological, emotional, spiritual, intellectual openings in your life. So the whole theme of the gathering room is waking up. Yeah. And a lot of us have practices to try to do that. And and one of the things about practice for me is it has to be consistent. Like if I, if I meditate once a week, not enough. If I'm going to get the real benefit of meditation, I mean, it's better than nothing. But if I'm going to get the real benefit, like almost every day or every day is definitely the best thing. A certain amount of routine is really wonderful for developing, like it's almost strengthening a muscle that, for example, takes you into stillness or allows you to back away from your emotional catastrophes. Routine is wonderful. And breaking routine is wonderful. So by the time most people in our society, actually, this is an old study. This is like 30 years old, so I'm sure it's different now. But when I read a study 30 years ago on how people adapt to the workings of the world, it said Basically, teenagers in the Middle Ages were considered grown up. First of all, they were going to die of plague like the next minute. But secondly, life was simpler and there wasn't as much to learn to sort of know your way around society. But 30 years ago, and now it's going to be way higher, 30 years ago, they were saying just in order to master the basics of functioning in modern society, how to run a bank account, how to drive a car, how to do all these things, people had to be about 23 years old. Um, now I'm sure that to get all the systems in place, the, the, the electronics, the telecommunications, everything, you probably have to be 40 before you really know your way around the world. So during that time, you're using what's called fluid intelligence. And it's a brain state where new neurons are forming really rapidly, new pathways are forming and dissolving as you learn and grow and change. Now, when you get, you really anchor something, like you really know your multiplication tables or whatever, that goes into something called crystallized intelligence. And crystallized intelligence is much easier to rely on. There's no sort of struggle to figure things out. There's no sense of uncertainty. You feel much more self-assured, much more relaxed. It goes, literally gets pushed down into deeper and deeper levels of the brain um, from the, from the, very edges where it's just starting to learn something. So it's great to have crystallized intelligence and routine. The problem is that when you come to rely on crystallized intelligence, when you've got enough to get through the world, most people stop learning. They resist change and don't do anything different. So 30 years ago, when people were 23, they basically stopped changing. It's a, you see that a lot in the animal kingdom around here. We see animals we were watching this little antelope called a bushbuck. And I've seen a baby bushbuck just dance, just run in circles around this rock where I was sitting and just jump in the air and kick his legs out and dance. And then we watched sort of middle-aged bushbuck where they're getting horns and things and they're like more relaxed and chilled, but they also don't play as much. They're not exploring as much. Then you get the adults and they're like, just leave me alone, I'm eating. And that's kind of, how humans are too. <laughs> so it used to be 23. Now I think fluid intelligence is necessary much later in life. Those of you who are in my generation know that we were like, yeah, we've learned everything there is. I know how to use a card catalog amazingly well. And then it was like, 
what the F? They changed everything and now I have to press buttons and it's all frightening me. So we had to sort of dredge up some fluid intelligence from a world of crystallized intelligence. The same thing happens in spiritual practice, that you get certain things sort of locked in and it, they work and it's wonderful and you, you're consistent and it's perfection. And it can be stultifying. And when something breaks into your familiar routine, you have to regain some of your fluid intelligence. It's, you, you get broken open, in um, Elizabeth Lester's beautiful phrase. Um, you go through a feeling of being a child and being flummoxed, but as the spiritual masters say, the best way to enter the kingdom of heaven, in Jesus' words, is to become as a little child. Um, getting that fluid intelligence and the openness to new things is awakening. Um, gracious Badger, my timing device isn't working, so you will have to give me timing cues. Okay. Is that minutes left or minutes past? past. Sorry, guys. We're just, we are doing something different. We are doing something different. So this is what I wanted to get to. I'm in Africa. I'm totally jet lagged. Um, the electrical outlets, I still can't figure out after all these years. Um, my hair dryer exploded this morning. There are a lot of things that are not settling into my crystallized intelligence. But on the other hand, I know that because of the frustration, because of the bafflement, because of areas where I just don't know what to expect and something altogether new occurs, I am going to be forced into fluid intelligence and openness. And the way to cope with it, well, two things. First of all, if you want an opening in your life, do something different. There's a psychologist, I think his name is Donald O'Hanlon, and he did an entire therapy system based just on doing one thing different in your day. So my favorite example of his was that he, he was a couples counselor, and he would say to couples who would get into a similar argument over and over, we get these patterns, right? Similar arguments over and over. He'd say, okay, the next time you argue about money, which you know, these couples would say, we do it every day. Go ahead and have exactly the same argument, but you have to go into the bathroom and he will sit on the closed toilet lid while she sits in the bathtub. This was in the age when all couples were considered heterosexual. So he'd say, you can have the same argument, but if you have it in the bathroom, in the tub, it's gonna be different. The next time you have the argument, just both put on hats. <laughs> and the idea is that it was going to puncture the crystallized intelligence of that pattern. And breaking pattern is one of the most powerful things you can do to wake up emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, and physically. So that's the first thing is do one thing different today. And the more different it is, the more it will open you up. There's another book by David Cord. David Cord Murray, sorry, called Borrowing Brilliance. I may have gotten his name wrong, but his book is called Borrowing Brilliance, and he's a business writer. And he talks about how the way you make breakthroughs in business problems is, well, the way he does, is that you, you, you worry about the problem you're facing, and then you go do the most different thing that you can think of, like going to Africa and tracking rhinoceros or whatever. For example, he said when he was working on this tax software, he had all these problems about how to help people do their own taxes online. And then he went to see the movie Star Wars. And he thought, huh, I'm going to, how could a tax program be like the movie Star Wars? And he created a software program where the IRS, the tax agency, was considered the empire that had the Death Star and everything. And the person doing their own taxes online would be Luke Skywalker, alone in his little, you know, spaceship with his little guns and things, flying along, guided by the force. And so he actually put the plot of Star Wars into this tax software and it went nuts. It became like it made him a zillionaire. And what he said was just get the problem, look at what it is and the familiar solutions, and then look at something completely different and say, how could it apply? So if you're wanting a spiritual breakthrough and you've been 
doing, I don't know, chanting, meditation, yoga, prayer, going to mass, going to church, going to temple, whatever it is you're doing, that's wonderful. Try going to a disco to look for spiritual awakening. Try going to a construction site. Try going to a family dinner with your horrifying family of origin or whatever it is um, and say, where is it here? You know, if, I, if I'm not finding it on the floor chanting and praying, where can I find it in an argument between two of my relatives? And what you'll find is that the more different the experience is, the more it cracks the crystallized intelligence, makes things fluid, and then allows things to reform in different patterns. Einstein talked about how he worked with that exact process, and he joked that genius is knowing how to hide your sources. And what he meant by that is he went out looking in the most unlikely places for hints about how to crack problems like general relativity. So do one thing different if you want to open up and then know this, it will not necessarily be fun. I mean, I hope it's super fun for the people who are joining me today in Africa. We have good times out in the African bush. But even if you're home in your apartment and you do a pattern break of any kind, you will feel discombobulated. That's the feeling of your crystallized intelligence being challenged. You may feel completely flummoxed. You may feel baffled. There are many words for this. You may feel bewildered. You may, f I like that word because it's bewildered. Um, but there's a feeling of things aren't great, which is not what we usually think, right? We go looking for great experiences. I say go look for new experiences. New experiences crack you open and that feeling of bafflement is exactly what you want to induce because it shows that your brain is trying to learn something new. So what you do when you get to the bafflement phase is you relax into it. You don't try to focus the mind to solve the problem. Instead, you open heart and spirit to what is present. So you open it to compassion for your own bewilderment. You open yourself to compassion for or to whoever's around you. Um, you open your soul to new experiences of, of consciousness, of understanding, of um, love. I mean, it always comes down to love. So right in the middle of being flummoxed and flabbergasted and bemused and all those great adjectives, you sink in and you say, it's okay. It's okay. So heart and spirit come in to calm the troubled mind which really likes its crystallized, hard-baked intelligence. It's okay. It's okay that everything is upside down. Everything is falling out. In China, they say there are periods when earth turns over heaven. So it's like everything in the ground goes up and like falls down and you're in the sky, but things are falling on you. And that's how it feels when a big pattern break occurs. And instead of fighting it, you say, ah, oh, yeah. Okay, this, this is the feeling of waking up. Got it. And as you relax into it, something very interesting happens to the mind. As it is brought into peace by the heart and the soul, it starts to make genius associations. It starts to say, oh, I get it. Tracking a rhinoceros is just like finding a soulmate. Like, you wouldn't think it. It's the David Cord Murray borrowing brilliance thing. But I will tell you for sure, finding your soulmate is exactly like tracking a rhinoceros. Because in your case, your soulmate is a rhinoceros. No, that's not true. But tracking will be the same. And, um, and then you'll say, oh, oh, I get it. Um, finding the right job is exactly like getting a snake out of my room. Not that there's ever been a snake in the room, ever, here at Longalozi. Um, but if there were, that happened to me in Phoenix twice. If there's a rattlesnake in the house, oh, that's exactly like getting out of my weird job. I'm not even going to give you the associations because they have to come up from you. But all it takes is break the pattern, allow the bafflement, calm heart, and that's, I guess, third, calm mind with heart and spirit and presence place to bring in spirit is to say it's okay right here right now 
and be present. And then third, allow, fourth, allow associations to arise spontaneously and, and trust it. And you'll have this new spark of fluid intelligence and you'll try it out. And if it works, it'll get just a little bit more crystallized. It'll be crystal clear. And then you have, you'll, if you keep this up, you have a whole crystal palace of new things to think about and new things to feel and new things of which you are now aware. So I hope you're having a wonderful Sunday wherever you are in the world. I'm going to go out and try to see um, some people and some beasties now. The Gracious Badger coming with me. Say hey. Hey. Um, and uh, we'll try our best to get you another gathering room next Sunday. But we got no promises because we're out breaking patterns. So yeah, when we do come back, expect some fireworks. <laughs> I love you all.